The terms microevolution and macroevolution get thrown around a lot in the modern creation and evolution debate. But unfortunately, we don't really stop and take the time to think about these terms and how we define them and whether they properly convey the concepts that we're trying to speak. And so today I want to kind of focus on this, very briefly look at the history of the terms and then how exactly we should use them in this context. It's probably best to start with the man who coined the term. Yuri Alexandrovich Filipchenko. Filipchenko was a scientist who did much of his important work in the USSR studying fruit flies. He was also behind the creation of the Institute of Genetics at the Academy of Sciences. Unfortunately, Filipchenko was also influential in the startup of the Bureau of Eugenics, so not the most likable character. In 1927, Filipchenko published a book entitled Variability and Variation, and in it, he divided evolution into two main types, microevolution, which is small-scale evolutionary changes, and macroevolution, large-scale evolutionary changes. And he kind of defined it as large-scale would be high taxonomic rankings, so you know, like the origin of a new family or the origin of a new order, whereas small-scale evolutionary changes would be like the origin of a new subspecies or the origin of a new species. Now, Philip Chingo differed from modern scientists and most scientists at his time because he didn't think that large-scale evolutionary changes actually happened through the mechanism of mutation and natural selection. And that's because he thought that variation was basically integral to an organism, a population. He thought that over time, the population of organisms would change even without selection acting upon them. Needless to say, most scientists today do not agree with Philip Chinko's original definition. Listen to what he said. The origin of the characters that differentiate the higher systematic categories requires some other factors than does the origin of the lower taxonomic units. The most common modern definition of the terms is that microevolution is variation within a species. In other words, within a species when you have a change in allele frequencies whereas macroevolution is speciation and the origin of other larger taxonomic categories as well. Creationists have moved towards redefining the terms in context of the created kind. Microevolution, according to them, is defined as variation within a kind, whereas macroevolution is the origin of a new kind. But when a creationist says that microevolution has occurred and macroevolution is not, what they're simply saying is that no new kinds have been formed. I think this is, however, a problematic definition, and, and here's why. For the creationists, new kinds cannot be created because organisms are automatically of the same kind as their ancestors. So that means that however much morphological or genetic change occurs in a lineage, they're always going to be of the same kind. So, in other words, even if alligators were to evolve to be as tall as giraffes and have wings, creationists would still say that's microevolution according to this definition because they're still in the same lineage, they have ancestors of that kind and therefore they can't become part of any other kind. And it's at this point where macroevolution loses all of its meaning. It doesn't actually give us any information about the amount of change or the degree to which change has happened. So when we define terms in this way, it's really telling us more about what different people think than how much biological change has actually happened. Another issue is that these terms conflict in their use. So when a creationist says that macroevolution does not occur, they're meaning to say that new kinds don't arise. But from a traditional sense, that's interpreted as meaning that they are species fixes, that no new species arise. Well, obviously those two things are not the same, and so there's the result of misinterpretation because of this kind of careless use of language. Furthermore, most creationists believe that subfamilies and other high taxonomic groups have evolved. And as a result, that is pretty major morphological and genetic change, and it falls under the typical definition of macroevolution. So the truth which creationists are trying to communicate is that there are separate unrelated kinds of organisms, but there's no compelling reason to redefine macroevolution to exclude it from happening within a young earth creationist framework. Instead, I think that creationists should just find better terms to delineate between their views and those of other, 
things. And I think that the term separate ancestry and universal common ancestry or common ancestry is a helpful way of delineating without trying to redefine macroevolution. Because I think macroevolution and microevolution can be helpful terms and that redefining in the, them in the sense that some creationists would like to makes them actually lose a lot of their meaning, become less helpful and in more confusing terms. So overall then, I would say that macroevolution does occur within a creationist framework because macroevolution includes the origin of new species, the origin of new genera, the origin of new subfamilies, and possibly even new families. And I think that we should just call it what it is, macroevolution. I don't think there's a need to actually redefine this term to mold it into some kind of young earth creationist word. Because at some point, we are all sharing and using this language, and language is supposed to communicate information. And when we're coming up with these terms like this, it's not actually helpful to redefine these words because they lose their meaning and become less helpful in speech. But that's just my thoughts on this whole microevolution, macroevolution thing. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Thanks for watching.